So let's get started. So we're together now until five o'clock. We're going to have some presentations, reflections via the chat and some small group discussions as well at the end of the session for you to sort of um, reflect and discuss on the content that we share. Okay, so first I'm going to give you an overview of the Wellbeing for Education Return project. So this is a national project funded by the Department for Education and essentially the department is giving all local authorities funding to support well-being and mental health in the return to school. In Nottingham we've taken the decision to join the city and the county on this project so we're working together. So first thing we're doing is training for mental health leads in schools and education settings and that's what we're doing today. So this week there's eight different webinars running across the county at a district level and we are delivering training that is generated by the Department for Education um, and then we have worked on it. Some of us in the group with other colleagues as well, we've worked on it to make it relevant to schools in Nottinghamshire. So all the resources are on the project website, you'll see in number two. And what we're doing today is we're focusing on anxiety and low mood. We did webinar one back in October. Don't panic if you didn't join us because the recording of the webinar and all the resources are on our project website. At the end of that webinar, we asked the people who attended, what would they like us to focus on in webinar two? And across all areas of Nottinghamshire, the strongest preference was for work on anxiety. So that's what we're doing today. Okay, so all of the training is going to be completed this term. And then the next phase is the development of a local offer website for mental health support. And that is going to be one website for anyone in Nottingham City or County that they can go to to find out information and support um, for children and young people wanting advice and support around mental health. OK, the other thing we're trying to do is to reinforce local networks for mental health needs. So that's one of the reasons we've delivered these webinars at a district level. So you can get to meet professionals from different teams. And also in the spring, we're going to have some new mental health support teams being rolled out. So all um, things that will be happening next after today, all the news and links to everything will be on our project website, which is the MED Support Wellbeing for Education Return. OK, so that's the big picture. This is the project website. Um, you might get individual emails, um, for example, invitations today for today, but all of the resources, links, everything we talk about today will be on this website and all the presentations will be available for you to download as PowerPoint files and use yourselves in your schools. So if you want to use individual worksheets that we share or you want to run sessions for your staff meetings or sessions for parents, you can use these presentations. OK, so in terms of the structure for today, I'm going to do an introduction and to remind us of the key messages in the Wellbeing for Education Return project. We're going to talk a bit about the psychology of anxiety and low mood. And then I'm going to give you a toolkit, which includes five different tools or approaches or strategies for supporting anxiety and low mood. All of these tools and all of this psychology is relevant for adults as well as young people, because what we're increasingly hearing in our conversations with schools and across the webinars so far this week is that school staff are facing great challenges at the moment and high levels of stress and anxiety, but also parents and carers. So all of the psychology we're talking about will be relevant for any person who's experiencing anxiety and low mood at the moment. Um, in terms of our last bit of housekeeping, I'm just going to give a recognition to where we are today working virtually and just to recognise that, that, you know, do what you need to do in, in terms of looking after yourself um, in the session. If you have any surprise visitors um, like animals, children, adults, deliveries to the door, do what you need to do if you need to get up and stretch, work away and um, just share with care, look after yourselves as we go through the session. You know, it's really hard work at the moment in schools and we just want to make sure that you're keeping in touch with us. If anything that we talk about today makes you think that you want a little bit more help, be mindful about confidentiality when sharing examples and respect value difference and diversity. And we're going to talk a bit about this in the fact that the current situation is like a storm and we're all in the same storm, but we're all in different boats. And there really has been a range of experiences within the last couple of months. So I'm going to start with the key messages from the Wellbeing for Education Return project 
which apply to adults as well as students. And the key thing really is that idea about the same storm, different boats. And we've had the full range of experiences. And I imagine even within some individual schools, you've seen the full range of experiences from people who've had traumatic experiences, such as sudden losses in their family, all the way up to children and young people being really excited and looking forward to the return to school and doing really well since they've come back. So that recognition of diverse experiences is really key. And we're just going to remind and remember to have care and compassion for everyone else and also for each other. And we're going to talk as well today about things that you can do to look after yourselves. So the key framework that the Wellbeing for Education Return Project is based on is the five key principles of recovery. Now, this actually was developed in Nottinghamshire and um, now has become part of the National Wellbeing for Education Return Project, which is really great to see the work of Nottinghamshire schools and professionals recognised. And essentially, the five key principles talk about the foundations for successful recovery after a crisis or a challenging time. And in terms of schools, these, they don't happen in any particular order, and actually they often all happen together. But these are the key ideas. To put emotional well-being first for everyone, to reaffirm the school's strengths and core values. And we find that in times of, of trauma, people feel lost and disconnected from their identity and their core values. So often activities to reaffirm these can be helpful in recovery. To place relationships front and centre, to reaffirm safety and routines. And I know this is something that you in schools are working so hard on on a daily basis. And also to acknowledge loss, change and bereavement. And to think about loss in its widest sense, to think about loss of opportunity, loss of connections with people in addition to experiences of bereavement. OK, so this key principle you'll hear in all of the things we talk about today and the tools that we're going to talk about in relation to anxiety are things that we're doing to try and promote these predictors of growth and recovery from difficult events. So from psychological research, these three things are found to be the best predictors of growth and recovery after challenging events. So the first is relationships and connectedness with other people. The second is flexible coping skills. So the ability to have coping skills, but to use them flexibly. So particularly important in the current context, isn't it? You know, things are changing daily. So we need to be able to adapt our coping skills, do different things on different days. And the third is having a sense of agency or control. The thing that strikes me when I look at these is the fact that the COVID situation makes these three things difficult. There's lots of uncertainty. There is disconnection because we can't be physically close to each other. And also there's so much in the current situation that is outside of our own control. So I guess the key message is that people who are struggling at the moment in terms of anxiety and low mood, be that adults or children, it's completely understandable because these key things that help us to grow and recover are difficult at the moment and we're having to work really hard to make them happen. Okay, so just as an initial check-in, what do people think of those models? Those of you who attended the previous um, workshop and you've been using it, any examples or reflections, any things that people want to reflect on before we get started? Kirsten, are there any things from the chat that you want to share, any comments or questions? Nothing in the chat just yet, they're all very quiet, so obviously thinking. Thinking, yeah. Um, in, in terms of our work, I would say the thing that I can see schools working on really well is that promotion of relationships. So working so hard to help people feel connected. And I guess what I'm hearing as well, in particular from schools, is for school staff being in schools and working with their bubbles, you're missing that connectedness with each other. And so that's definitely something that people are sharing. They're, they're, um, they're noticing that they're missing that relationship connection with, with colleagues. Okay, so let's talk then about the psychology of anxiety and low mood. Let's focus in on this particular topic based on the things that people wanted us to talk about this time. So linked to that idea that it's understandable that people are feeling anxious or feeling low at the moment, I'm just going to talk to you about this graphic, the mental health curve. And this shows us if we look at the general population, most of us are somewhere in the middle with moderate mental health most of the time. 
And actually things like feeling low, feeling a bit anxious are normal part of human experience. They're things that we'll always face. And actually they're not things that in using some of the tools I'm going to share that we can get rid of. They're things that we can learn to understand and cope with. So I guess that's a key message for all children who are feeling anxious or low, that this is a normal part of human experience. Sometimes for some people, it's very strong, it's very big, it's very overwhelming, but we can learn to cope with it and manage it. But we're not waving a magic wand and getting rid of anxiety or low mood because we, that's not real life. And there are challenges that we sometimes need anxiety sometimes, for example, to keep us safe. And we'll talk about that shortly. So that's a key message. And alongside that, for anyone who is feeling anxious or low about the current situation, that's understandable. It's a very difficult situation and some particular features of the lockdown, for example, make it hard for us to put our protective factors in place. OK. So when we then start to think about what do we mean when we talk about anxiety and low mood, let's look at some definitions first. And then I'm going to share some resources that you can use to explain these to children and young people and potentially other adults as well, such as parents and carers who might be, who might be feeling anxious themselves or supporting children who feel anxious. So anxiety usually has fear and avoidance of the feared thing at its core, whereas low mood usually has loss, demotivation and rumination at its core. And by rumination, I mean lots of time overthinking and focusing on, you know, unhelpful negative thoughts. OK, now we're going to talk today about how anxiety and low mood or depression are, are separate. And we're going to talk about the psychology of them separately, but they often co-occur and often for people experiencing this in real life, anxiety and low mood are meshed together in a really messy feeling. And sometimes one is more apparent than the other. So they often are combined and they sort of people can swing from one to the other. OK, so. One thing that you can access on the project website after today is a pupil friendly, a student friendly version of this um, anxiety presentation that you can use to present to children. So if you're doing circle time or running some um, RSHG sessions, you could do some sessions on anxiety. So um, there's a key stage three to five version and there's a primary one as well. And this is just one of the slides from that presentation, which tells us, reinforces some of those messages that anxiety is a normal part of um, a normal, healthy human emotion. It affects our thoughts, our feelings and our behaviour. And it can be quite frightening if you don't understand what's happening to you. So the very first thing we need to do in terms of anxiety is to learn about it to learn the language, to learn the words, and to learn what it feels like for us. The key idea within this learning is that anxiety is useful for survival. So anxiety is something that can be helpful. It's a prehistoric stress response that dates back to times when we were in danger of being chased by wild animals, and we needed our fight, flight, freeze response to keep ourselves safe. So anxiety is the response where if we're being chased by a lion, we get stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, our heart beats fast, our muscles tense, and we get ready to run away, which can keep us safe. However, what sometimes happens is we're in a place where we're physically safe, like a classroom, but our body might be having the same stress response as if we're being chased by a lion. So there's actually some really lovely videos that I'm going to share with you I'm going to share with you the primary one. There's a primary one and a secondary one um, for, aimed at different age groups, which are really useful to explain the concept of anxiety to children and young people. So let me play this video with me and then with you. And then let me know what you think of it. Do you think it's accessible? You know that scared or nervous feeling you get when you have to do something you're not sure you can do? Or go somewhere you've never been before? That feeling is called anxiety. And it can feel a bit different for each person, but it usually doesn't feel very nice. Maybe your palms get sweaty, or your body tenses up, or maybe you get a tummy ache. Maybe you've heard of anxiety, or maybe you haven't, but you've definitely felt it before. Because everyone feels that sometimes it's normal. You want to know something really weird about anxiety? It's actually trying to help you. It's true. All those uncomfortable feelings, 
Those happen because your brain thinks you're in danger and it wants to protect you. When our muscles tense up and we sweat, it gets us ready to do a lot of exercise, which is helpful if you need to jump out of the way of a runaway train or wrestle a Wolverine. Sometimes our minds go blank and we feel like we can't move or talk. That would be great if we needed to hide. Instead, we just feel stuck. When your brain does this, it's called fight, flight, or freeze. The problem is, sometimes your brain gets confused and it can't tell the difference between a charging moose and say, going to a new school. Both things can be scary and cause anxiety, but there aren't any dangerous wild animals at a new school, hopefully. Understanding where anxiety comes from is the first step in learning to deal with it. So the next time you're in one of those tough situations and you start to feel those feelings, like butterflies in your stomach or sweaty palms, or it gets hard to talk or move, remember, there's nothing wrong with your body. You're just having normal feelings of anxiety and they're actually trying to help, <laughs> even if they're not very good at it sometimes. What are people's ideas on the video? So just having a look on the chat, Def finding it useful, that's great. Finding that it's um, accessible, which is good as well. Any of you in secondary school, the same video exists with teenage characters and a little bit more complex vocabulary, talking a bit more about the brain and the amygdala, which are involved in the anxiety response. Brilliant, okay. Thanks so much for your reactions to the video, which is good. And Rebecca, yeah, this allows for discussion around this. Um, play the video and then have a chat. So it might be quite nice, you know, to start lessons or to start small group discussions. Lovely. Yeah, and Janet, you're talking about, you know, it's in sort of child speak, as we would say. Lovely, okay. So yeah, I would definitely recommend that video. Um, that there's a secondary one there as well, you similar content. The other um, thing that is quite useful to explain anxiety is the smoke alarm analogy. And some um, sort of upper primary and secondary students find this quite useful to think about anxiety like a smoke alarm. So the smoke alarm in our house is very useful, keeps us safe if there's a fire, it goes off and we escape. But if the smoke alarm was above the toaster, it would go off as if there was a fire when we just burnt our toast. So actually, if we think about anxiety as the smoke alarm that we do need to keep ourselves safe, but if it's above the toaster, if it's going off when we're not actually in physical danger, then we need to retune or move our um, smoke alarm to a different part of the house. And that's really quite useful. If anyone has you know, experience of sharing that smoke alarm analogy with staff, um, but young or staff or young people, young people have definitely shared that they found it useful. Okay, I think, Kirsten, are there more reflections coming in on the chat? No, I was just, it's just much the same, but I think anything that, that you can use as a visual to then promote a discussion with children and break it down so that it's something that, that normalises it. Because yeah. I think that's the big thing with things like anxiety, they hear it in a very negative tone rather than turning it into a more positive. Absolutely. Approach. Brilliant. And focusing on the fact that it's useful. I like the smoke alarm analogy, you know, the idea that you do need the smoke alarm to keep you safe, but it's about making sure it's receiving the right messages. Okay, so that's the psychology of anxiety. Let's just think briefly about the psychology of low mood. Okay, so when we talk about low mood, I want to tell you about the work of Johan Hari and this really interesting model that he has about the social factors that are shown to cause low mood. So Johan Harry is a journalist who has experienced depression in his, personal, in his own life uh, from an early age. And as a teenager, he was prescribed medication. So he talks about the genetic and biological causes of depression and the biological treatment, which is medication talks about the evidence for that but he also highlights the other the seven other causes of low mood which are largely social factors and he talks about the fact that disconnection from these things has been shown to cause low mood 
and reconnection with these things has been shown as an effective treatment for low mood. In some instances, the same or more effective than medication, particularly if the cause is one of these factors in the first place. And I think what's really powerful is to look at this model and um, to think about how the COVID situation has made us disconnected from some of these things. So for example, we're disconnected from other people. You know, we're working virtually, we're socially distancing. Some of us are disconnected from meaningful work. People have lost their jobs and people are not able to work in the way they usually would. Um, for some people, we've got disconnection from the natural world. If anyone is, you know, shielding or not able to get out and about as, they, as much as they usually would. And also disconnection from a hopeful future for some people. The future can seem scary and uncertain as things sort of linger on. And this can be really useful to share with, um, you know, staff, parents, carers, young people who might be feeling low. Again, to normalise that in the current context, to say, you know, it's completely understandable to be feeling low at the minute because disconnection from these things is shown in the research to be linked to that. But actually working hard to try and reconnect as much as we can is an effective way to sort of treat or to address those needs. So what do people think of this mood, this um, model in relation to low mood? Does it make sense? Are there any particular factors that you are noticing for either your students, your staff, your parents or carers, where you can see that disconnection from this is causing low mood? Anything to share, Kirsten? Nothing at the moment. I think mm -hmm. um, it's certain, certainly making me think about the importance of having a good understanding of, of what it means for us as adults yeah. in order for us then to, to help understand and navigate it with, with children because it, it is something that none of us have ever experienced before. So Absolutely. that's really why the chat's so quiet is that there's lots of people doing an awful lot of self-reflection, which is, which is really good. Um, yeah, Bridget's just saying absolutely makes sense with the current situation. Can think of a few families um, where this is apparent, and and with staff too. And I think that's the thing. I think it, it's just anything that we can do to help make sense of what's happening and the, the thoughts and feelings and emotions that that we're having. It'll help us to, um, you know, with the children as well. Um, so we've also got, um, you know, just a comment about um, grey weather helps. Uh, either wet breaks and kids not being able to get out so yeah just having that whole um, understanding of, of what they need um, mm -hmm. staff struggling with low mood and feeling isolated because mm -hmm. of the way that um, schools just a, a very different place to be um, and lots of things that have changed and, and, and that definitely I was speaking to some schools yesterday and they were saying exactly the same that mm. they're working in a, in a bubble really is working in a bubble and very isolating Absolutely. Um, so yeah finding other ways yeah um, head at Wales be just saying finding other ways to be there for staff is really important and that's a real challenge for, for head teachers really you know feel for heads who are, who are certainly having to work incredibly creatively in order to support not only the children but the staff and families as well. Absolutely it's good to hear that you're recognizing this and I guess that's where the sort of the compassion for ourselves comes in doesn't it to to understand that if we're struggling at the moment it's completely understandable because we are disconnected from a lot of these things that help our mood okay mm. so as we go through and um, hopefully what I'm hearing already is that these psychology models and research are making sense to you. So in the first instance, if, if people are feeling low or feeling anxious, the first thing to do is to share the psychology with them, whatever way that looks, to help them understand that it's understandable that you're feeling like this and other people are as well, and to understand why you feel this way. So it's really useful to hear from you in schools that this is making sense to you. And the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna share with you now um, a toolkit to use to support people who are feeling anxious or low. All of these tools, strategies, approaches are relevant for adults and young people. So you might be using them with your students, you might be using them with your staff, you might be using them with yourself. We had a bit of a think when we were planning this session about whether we would pick one of these and focus on it in detail, have a workshop, give you a chance to practice it, or give you an overview of 
a toolkit and we took the decision because so many of you are sort of leading on mental health in your schools that we would share with you an overview a toolkit tell you about these different approaches and signpost you to where you can find out more and um, as we go through the other reason you're here that we've decided to do it in that way is because different approaches work well for different people so for some people uh, for some young people you might think that you would use a particular approach and a different one for others so we're going to look at the look listen and link model we're going to look at relationship-based approaches with emotion coaching as an example then we're going to focus on emotional literacy and we're going to talk about a cbt that's cognitive behavioral therapy approach to understanding feelings and then we're going to give you some tools on laddering and scaling and we're going to talk about relaxation and breathing so this will be like your toolkit as we go through and um, i think we, if we have any else's in the room if we have people who work a lot in this area already i'm hoping you'll recognize some of these tools so please on the chat share your examples of things you've been doing things that have been working in the current context or any challenges you face it's really good to hear about what's happening so we'll talk for about half an hour on these various tools and then we'll give you a chance in small groups to talk to each other and reflect on which ones sound useful, which ones you've used before, etc. OK, so here we go. The first one is the look, listen and link model. This comes from psychologically informed first aid and this is a simple tool to help us think about how we do the connecting. So we know that connecting is a powerful protective factor and this is a little model to think about how we do it so look for signs of distress listen and don't underestimate the importance of listening and the power of listening and in some situations listening makes things better even in the short term so feeling listened to can be really powerful particularly if the situation is something that you can't really fix and um, listening to people and helping them feel listened to can be really powerful and then link them to sources of support in their in their own um, communities and families in support services will give you links to all the services involved in the session today at the end and also to online resources and everything we talk about today will be on our project website so a psychologist called Ewan Rees did some research on all these different types of children's talking therapy and the thing that he found was no matter what type of model the therapist used the most common factor that the children described as being helpful was being listened to and if they felt listened to they thought that the therapy was helpful so this is a graphic from um, a psychologist called dr karen treisman and we shared one of her other graphics in um, our first webinar this shows us that every moment and interaction can be an intervention we can all think about how we listen and make people feel listened to. And there's opportunities for intervention moment to moment in all of our work in schools and together with schools, with children and families, among professionals. So keep this in mind as we go through this section. In terms of the look element, there's two slides here that you might want to use um, within your senior leadership, within your staff, um, who are looking after your students to think about what should you look out for if you are thinking about children experiencing high levels of anxiety and high levels of low mood or depression. So there's some examples here, for example, around anxiety, you might look at avoidance of things linked to the fears. So interesting to sit and talk about a young person that you're worried about and see if you're noticing any of these things. It's important to remember the bigger picture and to think about all of these in the context of COVID. So for example, if you've got a young person who has poor attendance but it's because they're self-isolating because of track and trace it might not necessarily be linked to low mood so think about all of these factors in the context of covid and be aware of anyone children staff parents carers who are showing too many of these problems for too long so over weeks months with too wide an impact where it's having an impact on home school different activities that they're doing and always keeping in mind that wider picture of the COVID limitations as well. So this might be useful when you start to think about what should I look for? And then in terms of listening, I want to share with you some interesting research from young people. So the first is, you know, when we've asked young people what's going on for them in terms of mental health and coronavirus, there's some interesting things to share with you. The first is a report 
from an organisation called MH2K. It's a group of young people in Nottingham City and Nottinghamshire who did some research and just published in May 2020 their recommendations for mental health services in schools and colleges. So this might be useful for you to think about in terms of how you plan your mental health support, your RSHE time. Something that they've developed which is really useful are these posters, the hashtag real people campaign. So these are all young people who've used mental health services and they've developed these really powerful posters to challenge um, misconceptions and ideas in society about things like anxiety and depression. You can download and print these posters. Um, I think Rebecca's going to pop a link in the chat um, and you can show them in your schools. And when you print the poster, there's also links to local mental health services that children can access. So I think these are really powerful. And one of the things that came from the research around mental health services was that young people wanted to see and hear from real people, real stories who've accessed the help around anxiety and low mood. So these are really fantastic resources. I'd recommend that you have a look. In terms then of COVID, an interesting piece of research, and I think Rachel's also going to pop the link to this in the chat. Thanks, Rachel. Um, is some research that the charity Bernardo's did after the first lockdown. So they asked over 100 young people nationally who um, had particular vulnerabilities around poverty um, and risk factors that meant they were linked with Bernardo's. What kept them well while living through lockdown? And actually, this is a really powerful strength-based question, isn't it? You know, what kept you well? What helped you to cope? And you'll notice some really simple, powerful day-to-day -day things like spending time with pets and um, staying connected with friends digitally, getting a bit of fresh air and being outdoors. And so it's really powerful to hear young people tell us that this kept them well. And these are things that we can do, we can help others to do at the moment. And you will also hear echoes of the Johan Hari lost connections in here. So in this graphic, you will see that young people are connecting with some of these things, the natural world, other people, meaningful work, physical activity to help them stay well. So do we have reflections or questions coming in on the chat? What do people think of this uh, pupil views research about what helped them stay well? Um, well, just, just sort of prior to that, um, Orla, mm -hmm. um, there's been a bit of a discussion around the importance of uh, and one school in particular, or Matt, that have started actually doing staff supervision uh, oh, and they've had some training uh, from a social worker. So there's a bit of sharing going on there in terms of within the chat, in terms of um, how mm -hmm. that's being used and, and making some, some network connections there, which is really, really good. And Rachel very kindly has um, shared the, the links that you've just been talking about in terms of what kept me well. Fantastic. Um, and in terms of supervision, what we know from research is that the ability and space to reflect on your professional practice is a key mm. protective factor for your emotional well-being as a practitioner. So that's great to hear that happening in schools. I think also, all of the, the again, conversations I've had with staff, you know, as with children, they, they want to feel that they are being listened to. Yes. Um, and, and it's not about somebody going in and fixing it. It's just about somebody having the time to just sit and listen to what their, their worries or fears are. Absolutely. And the look, uh, listen, link model applies to adults as well. You know, parents feeling listened to, staff feeling listened to, young people yeah. as well. Uh, and just talking about exercise and connecting with the outdoors and how useful that's been for, for everybody. And I think certainly, um, you know, again, my personal experience is if I hadn't been able to get out each day, um, you know, I certainly, my mood changed quite dramatically. And I think it's even more important with the weather being, you know, the November, December grey days, it's even more important just to get out and get that, that fresh air. Definitely. And someone else referring to that early on in the discussion. Thanks so much, Kirsten. So in terms of the look, listen, link model, essentially it's talking about building on relationships and relationship based approaches create the context in which recovery can happen. So in, in all that work that you're doing, so um, one of you as a head teacher talking about, you know, really working hard to try and be there for your staff. In all that work you're trying to do to maintain relationships, you're creating the context in which recovery happens. Um, in terms of how do we use relationship-based approaches, emotion coaching is an evidence-based approach, which 
adults can use to support children in understanding emotions, solving problems and, and working their way through using relationships. So I'm going to share with you a brief video which explains emotion coaching. If anyone is using emotion coaching, because I know lots of our schools already are trained up in this model and are using it and lots of our support services are, please share examples or your experiences of emotion coaching on the chat. And if anyone's interested in finding out more, we're going to be organising some free training for schools as part of this project in the spring term. It's going to be funded by the Violence Reduction Unit, which works within the Family Service. Um, and so all those dates when they're announced will be on our Wellbeing for Education Return project website. So I'm going to play with you. I'm going to play, give you a break from the sound of my voice, give you a video explaining what emotion coaching is, the research behind it, so you can start to get an idea of how this is a relationship based approach for managing strong emotions such as anxiety. Oh, and then I just skipped the video. We'll try that again. Emotion coaching. Emotion coaching is an approach which focuses on the development of emotional regulation through supportive relationships. Children, young people, parents and professionals can all benefit from using emotion coaching. All emotions are innate, meaning we all have them, but that doesn't mean we can manage our emotions easily. We learn to understand and regulate our emotions through our relationships with others. Sometimes we experience emotions in a very big way, making it more difficult for us to process how we are feeling. For example, Charlie is feeling really sad because she is not being listened to. We all feel sad, angry or frustrated sometimes, but Charlie is still learning how to manage these big feelings. Dan Siegel suggests that the brain is like a house with an upstairs and downstairs. The upstairs brain is more complex and is where we learn, process language and develop problem solving and decision making skills. With experience, problem solving skills are refined, but the upstairs brain isn't fully formed until our mid-twenties. The downstairs brain is responsible for breathing and impulsive reactions to strong emotions like the fight, flight or freeze response. Sometimes when Charlie experiences very big emotions, she stays in the downstairs brain. On these occasions, she might act on the impulses she has without thinking through the consequences. Before Charlie can understand and process these emotions, she needs support from a trusted adult, such as a parent, carer or teacher. Once Charlie feels safe and calm, she can then be supported to move to the upstairs brain. Emotion coaching supports Charlie to be able to move from the downstairs brain to the upstairs brain through a process of co-regulation. Co-regulation is when a trusted adult is able to make a connection with Charlie and support her to feel safe and this can help her to learn to manage these big feelings. Emotion coaching strengthens relationships through increased understanding and empathy. It is essential that the adult connects with the child's emotions rather than judging the child's reasons for feeling this way. This is achieved by the adult connecting with the child before correcting the behaviour. Emotion coaching has five key steps. One, notice the child's behavior and tune in to the emotion beneath. Two, connect with the child and recognize emotional times as opportunities for intimacy and teaching. Three, listen empathetically and validate the child's feelings. Four, Help the child to verbally label emotions. Five, set limits on the child's behavior whilst helping the child to problem solve. There are a number of potential benefits to using emotion coaching. These include supporting children to regulate their emotions, promoting positive relationships between adults and children, 
increasing academic attainment and helping adults to feel empowered to manage children's behaviour. If you think you could benefit from emotion coaching. Okay, so a brief introduction. Um, and then just to show you that in Nottinghamshire, we use a four step model. It's just a combination of the various approaches and keep an eye on the project website if you are interested in emotion coaching and um, if you want to access further training. Okay, so we've talked about the look and listen and link model and emotion coaching as a model, which is evidence based for relationship based approaches. And what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about a different approach which is using CBT to understand feelings. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to share with you is another graphic from Karen Treisman, um, which is, again, a bit like the video I showed you previously, is a really nice starting point for discussions with young people. So some really nice key messages about feelings, different ideas about feelings and different um, things that you can share. OK, so we definitely recommend that. So you might be interested in using it. But essentially what we're doing in these slides is some resources for teaching. How can I understand my anxiety better? So let me show you. And if you're a member, you can download these as a, a secondary or a primary version to, to deliver these with young people. And people were talking previously as well about sharing this with parents and carers, too. So when we're talking about understanding anxiety better, in this particular approach, we use the CBT triangle. So this is cognitive behavioral therapy, and this is basically what CBT is. It teaches people that feelings, behavior, and thoughts are separate things, but they all impact on each other. So feelings create behavior, behavior reinforces thoughts, and thoughts create feelings. And the key message within CBT is that all feelings are okay. It's what you do with them that matters. So we might try and change behaviours or unhelpful thoughts, but we recognise, listen to and accept all feelings. And it's OK to be angry. It's OK to be scared. It's what you do with it that matters. So in particular, the place where we can try and make change and challenge things is when it comes to our thoughts and recognising that sometimes we can have lots of unhelpful thoughts that might make us feel more anxious or feel low. So what tends to happen when we're overwhelmed by a strong emotion, such as anxiety, is that the thinking part of our brain doesn't work properly and we start to have some of these unhelpful thinking styles. So, for example, catastrophizing, blowing things out of proportion or mind reading, which is imagining that we know what others are thinking. So having a look at these, you know, let me know on the chat. Do you recognize any of these? in yourself, in others, in young people that you work with when they feel anxious. So any reflections, anybody recognizing some of these unhelpful thinking styles as contributing to anxiety? They're very quiet today. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, somebody just saying, uh, can see some in myself, but don't say unfortunately, Bridget, because as we've just said, it's so important that we just recognise that uh, it's, a lot. it's what we do. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, that can be really quite powerful, Kirsten, can't it? You know, as mm -hmm. an adult, when we're helping a young person to um, understand this, to give them some examples of the things that we do ourselves. Yeah. So it's not about sharing our deepest, darkest secrets with the young people that we're talking with. But to giving them some examples of, you know, things that we do when we're a little bit stressed or we're a little bit worried. So the first step is recognising them. The second graphic helps us to think about what we can do about these unhelpful thinking styles. And um, the first thing that we need to do is identify and notice it. So the very first step is learning about these and um, recognising that they're happening. Then challenge it and then rewrite it. So actually, for some children I've worked with before, we've written down the unhelpful thought, like I can't do it. And we've rewritten it to I can try. So that's been really useful for some children. That's really, really hard. So actually, for some children, the strategy might be distract yourself from the unhelpful thinking style or the unhelpful thought. So different options to have a think about. OK. Another resource, we talked about it in the first webinar, and I just want to remind you of it for young people and for adults feeling anxious, 
is to separate out the things we can control and the things we can't control. And to think that we can let go of the things we can't control and to focus on the things we can control. So if you remember, one of the protective factors for recovery is a sense of agency or control. So actually, if we focus in on some things that we can do, such as having a positive attitude, limiting how much news we watch, for example, this can help us to feel that sense of control. So this is another approach for managing unhelpful thoughts. And finally, another activity that might be quite useful. Sometimes young people might find it very hard to talk about their own unhelpful thoughts and try and challenge them. So an activity is positive self-talk is what might you say to your friend to help them if they had those thoughts. And actually, sometimes that sort of emotional distance to think about, oh, how would I advise my friend in this situation can be quite useful and can be quite a nice way in for children if they want to think about, you know, strong emotions or unhelpful thoughts. OK. There's also a couple of prompts here for us as adults. If we've got young people who are feeling really anxious, some messages that we can send to start to sow the seed of some helpful thoughts. So we might not be as far yet as helping children to recognise unhelpful thinking patterns and challenging them, but we might be able to be offer some reassuring messages. And I guess the key thing that all these reassuring messages are doing is reinforcing the idea that you are eventually going to get better. It's not always going to be like this and you're going to be able to do it when you're ready. OK, so. I want to move on to the scaling and laddering because I want to give you some examples of this and, and see how you think it would be useful. A lot of those resources I just shared can be used in groups. So it could be used, you know, in assemblies, in, in classes, in small groups. Whereas the scaling and laddering are quite good for one-to-one -one work. So in webinar one, a group that we were asked about was young people, for example, experiencing anxiety-related non-attendance or ARNA. And some of these tools are really useful for some of our children who are really struggling to get back into the rhythm of school where they're finding school causes a lot of anxiety. So the scaling and laddering tools are all about helping people to face the thing that they're afraid of, to face your fears. And this graphic really is quite powerful in showing how it works. So it shows us that thinking about doing a scary thing can cause a high level of fear. But actually, if we then do the scary thing, we might experience, we will experience less fear. And then the more we do it, the less fear we will feel. Now, the key thing here is it's showing us that if we do something that scares us, it's very likely we will feel some anxiety. And that's a key message to share with children. You know, if we're, if we're helping them to do something that causes anxiety, we're not saying that it's going to be wonderful and this, where they're going to have a great time. We're, we're saying that it will be hard, but the more you do it, the easier it will get. And these are some tools that you can use to help children to plan how they're going to do that. So the first is scaling. So this asks a young person to put, to rate their anxiety about a particular situation on a scale of 0 to 10, and then identify small steps to reduce their anxiety. So what they will do is scale a situation. There's a worked example here for you. Let's say going to a lesson with an unfamiliar supply teacher rate how much anxiety they feel about that situation. So 10 is really high and, and zero is low. And in this case, the young person has said that they're nine, they've put a star on nine. And then talk with the young person about what would need to happen to make it an eight. So we're not saying we're trying to get to zero straight away. We're trying to say about small steps moving down the scale. And this can be really powerful in challenging the overwhelming nature of anxiety. So if you remember, we talked in the psychology of anxiety that it makes you feel stuck and overwhelmed and unsure where to go. Scaling is really good for that in breaking it down and just identifying a very small step that a child could take to just feel a little bit better or adults as well. OK, so you've got a worked example and then you've got a blank worksheet that you could use to work with young people. OK, so scaling is the first one and this is about measuring and trying to reduce anxiety in very small steps. The second approach I want to tell you about is laddering. And this is about moving towards the thing you're worried about. And just a bit of a health warning, really, that if you're working with a child who's completely overwhelmed by anxiety, 
and they're really, really just at the very early stages of understanding it, I would definitely start with scaling, just asking them to scale how anxious they feel. Because the laddering is about setting steps to move towards the thing that they're worried about. So it's probably something they come onto when they've got their head around the idea that they're going to work towards the thing they're worried about. And the way that this works is with the image of a ladder. So you put the thing that you want to do at the top of the ladder, you start at the bottom, and then you work out small steps to work your way all the way up to get to that goal. And the idea, I really like the idea of the ladder because you can move up and down the ladder. So one day you might be feeling really brave and you might get a few rungs up the ladder, but then you might come back down and that's okay. So in terms of laddering and scaling, what examples can you think of? What scenarios do you think you would be able to use these for the children and young people that you work with? Okay, I've just popped on the chat there. I can see you're, lots of people talking back to some of the unhelpful thinking styles, the filtering, absolutely. So in terms of the, the laddering and scaling, any examples where you think these approaches would be quite useful? In the, the webinar I did yesterday in Rushcliffe, one of the um, senior leadership people who came was saying that they were thinking about using laddering to help staff who feel anxious about delivering online virtual training. And they were talking about, you know, getting brave about using the technology. So interesting to think about that using use for adults as well. So any scenarios where you think you might be able to use laddering or scaling, pop it in the chat or in a moment when you're getting to talk to colleagues and um, see if you can talk about examples. Yeah, so Bridget, you're talking definitely about laddering the steps for coming into school and really breaking it down. And I was, work, I, I was working with a, a young girl last week who's in year eight and she was talking about, now she didn't call it laddering, but she talked about how laddering helps her when she feels anxious. And she talked to me about all the small steps she takes to feel ready to go to school. And she think even at the level of get up, get dressed, get your bag ready, go downstairs, have a breakfast etc. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes, another example, accessing online learning during isolation. Fantastic. So people are starting to think about how you might use the laddering. And those of you who work one-to-one -one with young people, if we have ELSAs or pastoral staff, these might be useful tools that you could use. Okay. Uh, finally, before you guys get a chance to talk to each other, I just want to mention relaxation and breathing. There's loads of really great resources around these activities. Um, lots of ELSAs use things, lots of uh, teachers use things in sessions, and we'll highlight some of them on the website. But I guess the key thing is to remember and to remind young people and ourselves that we need to use relaxation and breathing to have a relaxation response in our body, to bring down our breathing, to reduce our heart rate. And actually, has anyone worked with a young person where you've talked to them about breathing, for example, and you've had the response of, oh yeah, I know, take deep breaths, I'll try it, it doesn't work. And you could just get a sort of a dismissive reaction. I guess it's really important to share with young people that we need to practice the relaxation and breathing exercises. And it's likely that the first couple of times we use them, they won't be really effective in the face of strong anxiety. So we really have to practice them to build up their power, let's say. And it's useful for us as adults, I think, to think about where in our current day are we finding time with young people, maybe for ourselves as well, to practice our skills in relaxation and breathing, to make sure that they're really effective when we need them. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to give you guys a chance to have a little bit of reflection on some of these tools that we've shared. Okay, so... Um, Lovely. Oh, people sharing um, some relaxation and breathing on Go Noodle. Yes, I've heard loads of Elsas in Elsa training talk about Go Noodle. I, I think it's, you know, really popular. That's great. Oh, and Rachel uses them as well. That's fantastic. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you 15 minutes in a small group to talk with each other about the tools that we've shared today. If you have used them, please share them. If you have any others, please share as well. OK, so what will happen is you will get um, in a moment, you'll get an invitation to a breakout room and you'll pop into that room. Lovely. With uh, three or four other people and you can have a conversation for 15 minutes 
ask questions, have a discussion. And then I'll call you back in here at quarter to five and we'll do a little debrief and a check out. Does that sound okay? Lovely. Okay, so you should now get an invitation to the breakout rooms, a chance to discuss and reflect and 